Hi there. My name is Aaron Lancherman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture of EC 3400 Analog Electronics, we introduced the electrical component known as the JFET. In this lecture, we'll talk about biasing JFETs. I'm going to assume that you are familiar with the concepts of a DC bias circuit and a small signal circuit that goes along with it. If you're not, I recommend that you go back and check out some of my lectures on the topic in the context of the BJT. So I'm going to imagine that we could characterize a particular DC bias circuit via a Thevenin equivalent seen looking out of the gate, a Thevenin equivalent seen looking out of the drain, and a Thevenin equivalent seen looking out of the source. Remember that ideal JFETs are symmetric, and what's the drain and what's the source is determined by the voltages that are hooked to it. So we'll assume that VDD is higher than VSS. This arrow represents a PN junction. And although there are some weird circuits out there that forward bias that diode, in typical operation, this PN junction is reverse biased. So the gate source voltage for this NFET needs to be negative. Now, technically, there is a small current flowing through the gate. That would be the reverse saturation current of the diode. But we generally approximate that gate current as being zero. So we don't actually have to worry about RGG in our calculations. We're assuming no current is flowing across it, so no voltage is being lost across it. This is a major difference in doing a bias calculation for a JFET versus a BJT, where you do have to worry about that base current. So let's write a Kirchhoff's voltage law loop equation. The difference between the voltage sources VGG and VSS, these Thevenin equivalent sources, will consist of two drops. One is this drop from the gate to the source, and the other is this drop across RSS. That's going to equal RSS times IS according to Ohm's law. But the source and drain currents are the same, so I'll just write this as ID times RSS. And I want to be careful here. When I say drop, I mean in terms of as I'm thinking going around the circle. But remember, VGS is negative, so the source here is actually at a higher potential than the gate. Let's assume the JFET is in saturation, so we can write the drain current using this equation. Now, if lambda, the channel length modulation parameter, isn't zero, then this is a nonlinear set of equations that you can't solve in closed form. But you can use numeric iterative techniques to solve it. Quite often, people will just temporarily assume that lambda is zero, so this goes away, and it turns out you can solve ID using the quadratic equation. And that provides a nice starting point for an iterative solution for finding ID for non-zero lambda. Now remember that for BJTs, we generally assumed that the base emitter voltage was something like 0.65 or 0.7 volts. That's a convention that people sort of landed on because it gives you a nice current while also not blowing up your transistor. And you're able to get away with an approximation like that because the exponential characteristic of the BJT gives you such a steep slope. Here we have a square law, so the slope is not as steep and you can't get away with making a similar assumption for a VGS. Neglecting channel length modulation is equivalent to neglecting the early effect in a BJT. So we can take this square law expression and do a little bit of rearranging. I can divide both sides by beta, and then I can take the square root of both sides, and then I can move VP over to the other side. So I'll get rid of this here. Okay, rewriting that more cleanly, we wind up with this expression here. And then I can take this expression for VGS and substitute it into the first expression that I had on the previous slide. Making that substitution gives me something like this. Let me take the pinch-off voltage and move it over to the other side. So I'll have a minus VP here. And now let me stick parentheses around all of the voltages and move those over to the other side with a minus sign so that I can write this as everything equals zero. Now I have a quadratic equation where square root of ID is my variable in that quadratic equation and then ID is the square of that variable. 
So if I use the quadratic equation on this, my RSS is A in the typical notation of a quadratic equation that you learn in high school. My B would correspond to this one over square root of beta. And all of this stuff here, including the minus sign in front, this would correspond to my C. So applying the quadratic formula, I wind up with something like this, where the general statement of the quadratic formula has a minus here. That would give us a negative number, which wouldn't make any sense for the square root of a current or the current in this context in general. So we're going to take the positive root. Let me take this term here and multiply it by beta and then also divide it by beta so I'm not changing anything. So I can pull a one over square root of beta out of the equation that lands in front here. And then I'm left with a minus one here and a one here, and then I have a beta here. Now to get the drain current, I just square both sides. So I wind up with a square here, the two turns into a four, the square root on beta goes away, and I have RSS squared in the denominator. Now, if you don't trust the designer, you may want to double check to make sure that this BJT is actually in saturation. So we need to see that the drain source voltage is bigger than the gate source voltage minus the pinch off voltage under that assumption for a particular drain current. Well, we have this expression for the gate source voltage that we computed on the previous slide. I can compute the voltage at the drain by taking the Thevenin voltage at VDD and subtracting the voltage across this resistor, which is IDD times RDD by Ohm's law. And then I can think of this as a couple of different ways. I can think about starting at ground and then having voltage rise. So I have this rise over VSS. And then I can think about a rise of voltage going this direction across RSS, which is equivalent to IS times RSS, because this current arrow is going the opposite direction of this IS arrow according to my usual passive convention. So that's going to be ID times RSS because the source and drain voltages are equivalent. Remember that the term saturation means something very different for FETs and for BJTs. The equivalent of the saturation region for JFETs is referred to as the active region for BJTs, and I'll sometimes have a tendency to call this region for FETs active to try to stay consistent. But the term saturation for BJTs refers to what we call the ohmic region for FETs. So that's very confusing. You just have to live with it. Here's an example of a simple scheme used to bias the gate with a voltage divider. And this is equivalent to a similar scheme we looked at for BJTs. To find the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the gate, I can just use superposition. If I temporarily ground V minus, then I have a voltage divider for V plus where we are dividing over R2. And then I can temporarily ground V plus and we have a voltage divider where we are dividing across R1. So the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the source is just RS. So I'll substitute that in for RSS. And for VSS, well, that's just V minus. And I'm not going to bother spelling all of this out, but you can take your VGG here and plug it in here. And that will give you the drain current. Now it turns out you don't actually need all of these resistors. For BJTs, we needed to set up a network like this in order to bias the base up from the emitter in order to get current to flow. But remember that a JFET is a depletion mode device. If the gate to source voltage is zero, well, a current will flow, and then you make that gate to source voltage go more negative in order to choke off the current flow. So I can actually get rid of R1 entirely, in which case the gate is at V minus. Remember, no current is flowing through the gate. But there is a current flowing down through RS, and that means that the voltage at the source needs to be higher than the voltage at V minus. So that will mean VGS is negative, which is what we need. I'm calling the remaining resistor RG. Now, VGG and VSS are both V minus, so those wind up canceling and I'm left with this minus four beta RSVP term here. 
So this gives us the drain current for a self-bias scheme. Now we can go the other direction and try to find the appropriate RS that will give us a specific ID. You can do that by manipulating this equation, but it's actually easier to go back to some of the earlier equations. So manipulating this expression, we can write something like this, and then I can take the expression we had for the drain current in terms of the square law. Remember, I'm approximating the channel length modulation parameter lambda as zero. And now I can take VGS and substitute it in here to write this expression. But notice I have a square here. So I can take everything inside the parentheses and negate it, which gives me this expression. Now, let me divide both sides by beta. And then I can take the square root of both sides, which gives me this. And let me take this and copy that onto the next slide. So I can move VP over and then divide both sides by ID. Sorry, I just realized I'm being incredibly inconsistent with my use of color, but I'm too lazy to go back and fix it. Now, I've done this entire lecture in terms of this beta parameter that shows up in SPICE models, but we can also characterize JFETs in terms of this parameter IDSS, which shows up on data sheets. So if I divide both sides here by beta and divide both sides by IDSS, I can replace the one over beta here with VP squared over IDSS. The square root turns that VP squared into a VP, which along with this VP can be factored out in front here. And then I can write the expression for RS like this. And you'll frequently see this kind of form with JFETs where you have the drain current over IDSS that shows up in a lot of formulas. So this is a DC bias circuit. And the more general complete circuit you might capacitively couple the input, and you would capacitively couple the output typically, although you could DC couple it to some other stage. Anyway, if you capacitively couple the outputs, let's see. Here we would have the output of a source follower, also known as a common drain amplifier. That would be equivalent to the emitter follower in a BJT. And if you take the output up here, that would be a common source amplifier, and that would be equivalent to a common emitter amplifier for a BJT. Now, if you happen to have a power supply that was unipolar, so V minus was zero volts, then you wouldn't really need that capacitor. You could just take your input, if it is referenced to ground, and stick that right at this junction of RG and the gate. So that's pretty convenient. And you'll see this used in things like guitar pedals. Now, if you want, you can get rid of the input altogether and just use this as a current source. And if you do that, you can get rid of this resistor. And then you can pick a resistance to give you whatever current you want. The biggest current you can get is IDSS, and you get that by getting rid of the source resistor here. The self-bias concept also applies to depletion mode MOSFETs, although I don't think depletion mode MOSFETs are used that often in analog circuits anymore. Depletion mode MOSFETs were used in digital logic circuits when you had strictly NMOS or strictly PMOS processes, but that all kind of went by the wayside when CMOS came on the scene. There are depletion mode power MOSFETs, but these are probably being used as switches and not in a linear mode. Self-bias schemes are commonly used with vacuum tubes, so I would point you to my guitar amplification and effects lectures to learn more about that. Before we dig into JFETs further, I should mention the elephant in the room, which is that JFETs have tremendous variation from component to component compared with other semiconductors you can buy. So if we take a look at this VGS off, which is equivalent to RVP, for a J202, that ranges from minus 0.8 to minus 4 volts. For the IDSS, the drain to source saturation current, that ranges from 0.9 to 4.5 milliamps. So a lot of times people will have to select JFETs to have certain characteristics. So that might be written on the schematic or it might be written in some auxiliary documentation. But in any case, you have to just buy a pack of JFETs and find one that suits your needs.